Thank you, Margaret, for the invitation. Um, just a little bit about, I know it sounds ridiculous to be saying, but the beautiful book. I mean, it really is beautiful in terms of the colors and the painting on the cover. I'm not sure the poems are equal to the beauty of the outside, but um, the painting is done by my niece, Vanessa. Uh, thanks to Julie Marquette, who is the uh, driving force behind um, Lost Valley Press. Uh, she did the design. Uh, thanks to Sarah Bennett, who did the design of the text inside and took care of all of that, came up with the ideas and such. And uh, he couldn't be here today, but this, I mean, people often, not often, but throughout the time that I've been writing poetry, people have said, when are you going to put out a book? When are you going to put out a book? Put out a book. Uh, I just couldn't get my act together, I suppose. So my friend Andre Juarez, whom many of you already know, said, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And he pretty much pushed me into putting something together. And it was a process, and I got some help with the script, the, post, the, the manuscript, and looking at it, and so on and so forth. But if Andre hadn't been there, and if he hadn't really pushed me and cajoled me, I probably would have never done this. So great thanks to him, kudos to him as well. He can't be here, maybe he will be there. We're going to do an official book launch on the 12th of March uh, at the Miriam Gilbert Public Library in uh, West Brookfield. Since it's my hometown, that's where we're going to do it. So some of you have actually been to the kingdom, to the valley. And yes, Lick, I know you <laughs> have. Um, I want to read the postscript to give you a sense of um, this place that many of you, if you haven't even been there, know that I speak of a great deal. That it's a place that I go to for, um, I guess we'll find from the postscript. So here in the back of the book, in 1984, my parents perched a small log cabin overlooking a pond in a sparsely inhabited valley at the end of a long dirt road in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. In time, with the coming of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, the family built another cabin to accommodate the gathering of the tribe. The rolling hills of the pastures on the horizon, the wildlife, the stillness needed for dreaming have long been the wellspring for my writing. In the late 80s, 1980s, after a visit to our family cabin, the poet Bill O'Connell named the place Paradise. It remains a place where poems and peace can be found. So I'll start with uh, my hastily <laughs> created list since I left the plans at home when we left. Um, hopefully they'll give you a picture and a sensation of the place. So I'm going to begin with a, po a poem called um, Letter to Elizabeth Away in France. I've wondered all day what might be important enough to tell. Certainly last night, the gray day growing darker and me without sadness. At dusk, two blue herons, slow and prehistoric, along the stillness at the center of the pond. The haunting cry of doves. And with morning, the world brilliant again. Points of sunlight like diamonds spilled across water. One slow tractor turning yesterday's hay where the earth meets the sky. Summer's wind lifting the heavy branches. To know my heart now, summon the smell of water at dawn. The quiet voices of a father and son fishing among the fallen trees close to the far shore. The sudden power of last night's rain. We, when Elizabeth was teaching at the a day school in Fitchburg, Appawa Day School, we had the privilege of living in faculty housing. And we had neighbors 
it one of the first places that we lived. This is a poem called Totem for Rose, and it's dealing with a, a large face that was that's carved into this walnut grain, and you'll get the rest from the, from the poem, I hope. So totem for Rose. Some mornings my wife kneels in the bed of flowers close to the stone porch, believing he sings to her. Like all music, his is written into the silence we carry with us. His dark and weathered face, a spirit carved into walnut grain. When our neighbor moved away, she was filled with sorrow. We found him leaning against the granite cornerstone, a note left pinned to our door. He belongs here with you. My friend mistakes his expression for eternal pain, eyes half closed, lips twisted as if just before some terrible song of mourning. I explain it's not the ruin of the soul he sees, not among the stargazers and the wild men, the tulips and the iris. I tell him my wife believes a different story, one older than the myth of our exile. She says each garden is passage into paradise, this face reminder of our rapture. Taking shape. We don't choose love, it chooses us. It's too big for us in the beginning, but takes our shape in time, like, fi like a fire that reduces itself to red heat, like a storm suddenly more than the sky, becoming the powerful maple swaying like women, like men drunk with love as long rolls of thunder move over the valley. Like a sudden explosion, of swallows in the cool morning trying to keep form above the pond, finding new shape in the dark shadows of the barn. We have no control of the magnificence in our lives, no determination for what flowers in us like wild blossoms that are fragrant in the darkness of the spirit, for the tenderness that casts delicate shadows in the white light of the heart. Well, I have these conversations with my students, and sometimes I talk, I talk to them. I'm always giving them prompts when, we're, when I'm doing creative writing, and I often tell them I could never work this way. It's just, it's not the way I work. I just need to sit there. And oftentimes it's with books close by. So you'll know this because th this epigraph, it's called In the Valley, and it is an epigraph from Charles Wright, wherever you are, is a monastery. Dark wings of hemlock slow in the morning wind, saplings of maple and oak. A sudden war along the tops of trees, one crow banished by two. And then a return to singing in the forest of the far shore. A stillness in the valley blemished by these words. Yet how else to say there is a luminous yellow green in the newly hayed fields of the horizon. The young men have moved on to new pastures. That the sky is the color of what slate above those fields. The air so thick it shapes us like the breath of God. And the wind gently rocking a boat waiting on silver water. I'm going to read a poem I can find it. Um, it's called Song for Natalie. Natalie's mother is here. So I'll read the poem. Tired and overcome, 30 years, tired and overcome with the delicate perfume of lilac, I sink into my chair, cold wine and the pale spring moon. Suddenly, Natalie, my neighbor's young daughter, is running into the coming darkness, shouting angrily that she is old enough, old enough, old enough. She has not noticed the moon, is not drunk with lilac and the dying lavender sky, does not know that she is not old enough, but that with each step into the terrible darkness, she moves closer to that moment when she too will stagger into the face of beauty. 
the heart knowing its burden, when the brilliant moon and the sweet lilac and the quiet night are enough. Again, the soul. It's the body that tethers us to the world, of that I am certain. It's the soul that puzzles me. Does it grow larger with our steady determination toward death? Grow ripe like the fine August garden with the suffering we provide? With love and work and music? Become the shine of what is important in our lives? And if so, what then? Released, will it still hear the crows at dawn? Smell the bitterness we knew staining our hands after tying the tomatoes? Will it remember the kindness of women? Or does the soul diminish each day? A slow distillation into what is pure, our growing old, the alchemy, a reduction of particulars. Our sitting close to the Vermont pond at dusk, happy with the smell of water and the arc of swallows. How we are puzzled by our gratitude for that sudden loss in the middle of our life, rolling away wet and spent from love in the thick July heat. How we manage the terrible ache that accompanied our witness to the world's suffering. Can we say our ordinary lives burn in the furnace of that living, that what is to be found in the ashes after is without imperfection? Is it enough to name it mystery or essence, compare it to the shadows growing into darkness at dusk? Can we call it the season of lilac delicately alive on the soft night wind? Without us, what will its life be then? What song will it know? What longing. <coughs> you know, the more I've been going through this book and I've been reading through it a lot, I've learned, well, I've learned a lot about myself, but I, I'm starting to realize that a lot of times what I'm writing about is not, I'm using words to talk about how we can get comfortable without words. <coughs> Does that make sense, Claire? I mean, it, there's a stillness and there's a quiet to this place. And I'm, I'm reading through the poems and I'm, wait a minute, I'm, I'm often talking about people not talking to each other, just comfortable in that, in that presence. So this came from an observation because the, the valley goes out from the cabin and there's a deck, we've built a deck so that you can look down the pond and the valley and through the trees and see the pastures and so on and so forth. And I observed this couple. Um, I gave the, the poem the title, but I observed this couple as they were, and, and oftentimes the poems will come from those observations of what's going on in the water. Voyage, the long marriage. How long has it taken them to arrive at this understanding? Him at the prow of their skiff, tall, thin, white beard lit by the sun, looking out like an explorer, reeling his taut line from water. Her turning the quiet motor every now and then with her left foot seated on the pedestal chair to the rear, setting their direction, bending her head again as if in prayer when she returns to the open book in her lap the two of them moving slowly into shadow, into light, shadow, and light again. All morning like this, no words between them. So when Bill and I are often talking about trying to write a poem, we go to William Stafford's old comparison, you're fishing, we're fishing. So sometimes when I'm sitting on the deck and the boats come by or the fishermen come by, I'm wondering, what the hell are they thinking? Because here I am sitting there with books and a pad and a piece of paper and they're doing this. So the poem is called The Fisherman and the Poet. I'm just 
trying to create, what are we understanding about each other? Comes with an epigraph from William Stafford. What the river says, that's what I say. Here in the kingdom, we are brothers in waiting. The man standing in his skiff in the cove below, the whip whistle of his line, the percussion of his lure on sunlit water. On the hill above, I turn the pages of Bill Stafford's poems, waiting, pen and pad close by like a net to be lifted from the dark, waiting to hold the gleaming and thrashing body. And those of you who write know that when that tug comes and you pull on it and you got that fish, it's, it's thrashing and gleaming. This is pretty self-explanatory. Summer's dusk. Small boats carry whispers close to the stony shore. Old and young, mother and son, two lovers drifting under a rising moon. The long, slow wings of one heron close to the wet slate sky. Two loons, an echo that quiets the heart, drifts into the still arms of dark hemlock along the shore. Each cast is an act of faith. Whip, whistle, hiss, and then the old waiting, the old wonder. What is taken as a sign. The coming night, sweet with the smell of a second cutting. The black frenzy of bats close to still water. And you're all familiar with the term cutting, right? Yeah? The second cutting, you get three or four out of a season in the summer, the farmers, though. I just want to make sure. I mean hay. I mean hay. <laughs> get that hay in the barn. And sometimes it's just to say, okay, they're gone. Trying to be tender. Raising his thin t-shirt over his head, my father asked me to change the dressing on his back where death's black root has taken hold of one more mole. It has come to this again between us, the ritual of tender care. My hands, now middle-aged, gently pulling the old bandage off the soft skin, off the soft milky skin, cleaning the wound left by the surgeon's scalpel, pressing the back of my father's head forward so the skin will tighten, the new bandage hold true. What, I wonder, as I pull his shirt slowly over my careful work, is whose death do I now know better? His? Or my own. Two horses. Two horses thunder into the sun at the center of the pasture. What cries come deep from their magnificent bodies fill the sky. I love to watch them when they first charge from the dark barn into sunlight, tossing their great heads, pushing aside the strong spring wind. I love to feel the earth tremble as they run along the old stone walls. I love to walk out under lush maples and watch them finally come to rest, their brown bodies shining, their two heads close in the stillness they have made, their soft breathing loud enough so I may never forget. Joy. Some days there's no explaining it like shorebirds rising all at once from the mudflats of my bones. I suffer from puritanical guilt. I do. So sometimes when I'm sitting there waiting for poems or just reading, I'm saying to myself, I should be doing something else. I should, I should be doing something more productive. I should be, I should be doing something else. And it, it, it sometimes, it gets at me. So this is a poem, and, and especially true when your wife goes off to work. 
And you're sitting there going, hey, this is okay, this is okay. But then, you know, all of a sudden that voice of guilt starts to whisper in your ear. This is called Two Lessons. And it uses some of the Tang, um, some lines from some Tang poets that you'll get there. So it begins with an epigraph from Po Chu Yi. Tired of my br writing brush, I gazed out the windows. I am alone. She will return in the darkness of late afternoon, weary, maybe even sad. I will try not to be so happy it hurts. <laughs> All day she lures her students back to the board, away from the windows, scolding those who do not pay attention. My chair sits facing out over the valley, sunlight on new snow, smoke rising from the village chimneys. In this empty room, the quiet of the heart. Occasionally, I will turn a page, sometimes close my eyes. When she returns, I will read her poems from the Tang. Wang Wei writes, What's a man of peace to do all day? Du Fu asks, how many times in one man's life can he listen to heaven's music? I've said this before at other readings, um, and I have some students in the audience, but oftentimes when I'm teaching creative writing, one of the prompts that I say to my, tell my students that they can choose from, I never force it on them, write a moon poem. And sometimes they say, what do you mean? A moon poem? What are you talking about? Why, why do we need to write about the moon? Anybody see the moon tonight? Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Diego, did you see the moon tonight? <laughs> um, so they, I say it's a tradition. It poets have been writing about the moon forever. Try writing a moon poem. August Moonrise. Like a young woman Averting her gaze, the pale pearl face of the moon rises over black pines, becomes less coquettish in the open sky. Her lost twin trembles on dark water. I never thought in my life I would use coquettish in a poem, <laughs> but I just, it, it seemed to work. This is it's called A Small Map of Melancholy. And it's for Catherine Reed, whom some of you know, and um, Michael Boudreau, whom some of you know. Catherine and I were in a workshop, remember? And we were um, generating poems. And Catherine wrote a poem about her mother's hands which I loved. I thought it was just wonderful. And she was so unsure of it. And she didn't know if she wanted to bring it up. And she didn't know if she should read it to everybody. And I said, no, no, it's beautiful. It's lovely. And then uh, the series that I had that called One Poem at Worcester, where we would come and read poems, she brought it. She had polished it a little more. And it was really, really lovely. And she gave me the copy. So what is it they say? Some writers will write their stuff, some will steal. I can't remember the cliche or whatever else. Well, that's why I dedicated Catherine, because I took a little bit of her mother's hands and I had to put them in the poem. <laughs> All morning I wandered the early winter rooms of our home, carefully carrying the soft music of the children's sleep. I stop and stand in the still light, slanting through the small bay window that looks out on the village green. Already the skaters have returned, some steady and graceful, some not. First, coffee warm in hand, I hold in the other one poem given to me yesterday by a wise friend. Her words are a different music. Her hands are the hands of her mother, delicate wings coming to rest on a small oak table. My shadow stands with me still against the pale wall. The bare trees make a voice of the wind. I cannot stop remembering the dead. So here's the story. We're in the south of France, my wife and I. And um, it's my second trip to Paris. 
not to Paris, to France, because we're not in Paris, we're in the south of France. And um, we had this ongoing bickering with each other. Mild, of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought she'd understand. <laughs> she kept wanting to go up this, this, see? It's got her already, I'll catch hell about it later. She wanted to go up this small sloping street into this, and she said, let's go. And I kept saying, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go, let's go here. And we would always go, the town was Fort Calquier. So we would go to Fort Calquier, and there was, and she, every time we'd go, she'd say, come on, let's go up there. And I said, I don't want to go, I want to go. Well, finally, I acquiesced, of course, knowing what was good for me. So we go up there, and she was right. I was an idiot. We should have gone the first day, but we didn't go for a long period after term. Pilgrim. No longer the music of rain falling in the stone square in Fort Calquier, the stone fountain at center spills cold water from tier to tier. After days of darkness, shadows deepen. The market takes its shape again. Row of ripe cheeses, alley of saucisson, pig's feet and jellied organs, circle of wheat and sugars, circle of black chocolate. Close to the pitted dragons spitting water, melons split to the heart, peaches and dusky plums, dark hills of cherries, bench of bright blossoms. The murmur of voices begins in the first weak light, becomes the cacophony of bargaining for what is needed, what is ripe. Wet stone grows whiter as the sun climbs higher into the square sky. A woman rocks an infant, eyes closed, face tilted into that sky. She sings softly as her child dreams what is warm sunlight on his small head, the body of his humming mother. For centuries, I imagine, it has gone on like this. The village climbing the small streets to the square, the bounty of harvest the only story, one bell ringing far out across the valley calling. I've journeyed all my life to get here. Understanding the old heart. in candlelight, sitting on the stone porch with tangled geraniums and trembling shadows, night rustling the spent lilac, Elizabeth sighing before she whispers her weariness and goes off to bed, alone and lonely and happy with my wandering mind, moonlight occasionally, dinner plates resting on the torn tablecloth, dogs barking in the valley below, the fragrance of lilies just opened, the strong smell of potted basil. How we come to believe in our life, enter the quiet rooms of the heart attentive, as if for the first time, making our way slowly, finding something sweeter than ambition. I sometimes use this as an example of the power and the necessity of illusion. So some of you know the story, the myth of Li Po's death, the great Tang poet, right? I won't tell you it now, but some of you already know it. Oftentimes, I should say, yes, Elizabeth and I are there. Yes, the family is there. But there are times I'm really blessed, not that I'm not blessed when I'm there with other people, but I'm blessed to be alone, to be alone. This was one night. Night darkens the river, two moons shining. Opening one more bottle of wine, I walk to the water's edge and pull my boat ashore. The legend of Lipo's death. Le Lipo liked his wine quite a bit. And the legend is that Lipo went out into the waters and he leaned over his boat to kiss the moon. 
and he fell in and drowned. So, I'm serious, that's the myth. And I just said to myself, after uncorking another bottle of wine, maybe I ought to bring that boat up on land. <laughs> that might be a good idea. Remembering the legend of Li Po's death. So really, the poem is a cautionary tale. <laughs> Night darkens the river, two moons shining. Opening one more bottle of wine, I walk to the water's edge and pull my boat ashore. <laughs> All right, two more poems. This is another. of a, a time when I was there by myself. Growing old, and it comes with the epigraph from the great Polish poet, in my mind the great Polish poet, Adam Zagajewski. Solitude tastes like opium. It was the only way he knew, into the mountains and away from the noise, days without speaking, his only music, the rain falling through the trees, one loon calling to another at dusk. In time, how the quiet became him, dressed as he was in the color of its light. Each footstep measured and soft and sure upon the earth, wandering with the deer at night, a spirit in the heat of the herd. And later, with his return, he closes the cabin door until he knows the quiet truth of the latch like an answer. His one slow breath, against, steady against the candle's flame. What he knows when he lies down in the darkness is a radiance resembling God. It's amazing that for me, and I, I started to revisit this from some of the poems, but. I don't want to disturb anything when I'm there, sometimes because it's so quiet. And I, I'm just, everything slows down, and you try to keep that quiet. And really, it's one of the reasons I know why I go there, among other things. Um, okay. Longing late spring, and I had to open the poem with a haiku because, as you'll know later on, I'm talking about the great Japanese haiku writers. Longing late spring for yuka. Rain begins again. Birds build nests beneath the eaves. How still my heart is. Last night, I stood above the pond with a woman from Japan who said she knew how poems could be found here. This morning, she returned to Boston, and I am alone, only the moon in memory as it climbed through the hissing trees into a sky suddenly free of storm. Drinking cold wine, we said the names of Bashao, Busan, Isa like a prayer. We might have said crickets, night birds, shadows born from a pale northern light. Her small body swayed like a thin reed in the night breeze, and she leaned closer to a moon older than any homeland either of us knows. Yuka said, the songs of birds at dusk are poems. Moonlight does not break the grass. I am far from home, but in Japan, the sound of distant bells echoes in my heart. Thank you. <laughs>